Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is the Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, the Behavioral Corner. Please hang around a while. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Welcome again to the Behavioral Corner, where we hang. What a job I get to hang on the on the corner, see the folks coming and going. And, uh, you know, as luck would have it, uh, we bump into some very interesting people on the behavioral corner. What it's all about, briefly, is, well, behavioral health, big topic. What's that mean? I'll tell you. It, simply put, uh, behavioral health are the decisions we make, uh, choices, activities we engage in, and the impact all of that has on our um, emotional psychological, even spiritual well-being. Big topic. Covers lots of stuff. Uh, so we're grateful to have uh, with us somebody who is in a field who uh, also uh, is about the business of uh, keeping an eye out on everything. Um, uh, our, our guest is uh, an investigative journalist, Ed Mahin, and he is with something called Spotlight PA. Uh, that's how he caught our attention here on the Behavioral Corner. Uh, this is an extraordinary uh, group um, about which you'll learn more in a moment. Uh, they are, and groups like them around the country, what I think to be the last best hope for any kind of meaningful journalism that we're going to get. So we welcome to the Behavioral Corner our guest, investigative journalist, and he's an award winner, uh, Ed Mahin. Ed, thanks for joining us on the corner. Thanks so much for having me. No, our pleasure, our pleasure. I see your stuff in the Inquirer there, one of your collaborators. But we ought to begin for people outside of the area where we are uh, to learn as much as we can about, about the nature of a Spotlight a PA. Tell us, tell us about it. Sure. We are a partnership of several newsrooms across Pennsylvania, a part, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Penn Live, the Patriot News in Central PA, uh, Trib Live, Pittsburgh Tribune Review in, in Western PA, and WITF Public Media, which is a radio station in also in Central PA, they've uh, sort of combined to create this one newsroom uh, based. It started out based in Harrisburg, focused on state government and issues affecting uh, people across Pennsylvania, and really the focus is on accountability and investigative work, trying to do stories that, for whatever reason, aren't being covered or taking time to, to dig deeper into stories that, that are being covered. And so, yeah, we're, and now we, we've spread out, we have some reporters uh, across the state now, um, but I'm based uh, south of Harrisburg. Just, just a background for some folks who might not understand why something like this would come together. Uh, the stories that you talked about, the purview that you guys have uh, as a watchdog, more or less, what's mm -hmm. going on behind those doors that we need to know about? That story and those stories are not being covered for a multitude of reasons, as you mentioned, not least of which is resources, newspapers, traditionally um, the, 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 the organizations that would do this, as we know, have been decimated by new media. They don't have the resources individually. So you can see how uh, like-minded people will go, well, let's collaborate. Let's, let's share what resources are left among us and uh, maybe get the... Uh, some of the parts to be greater than the, than the whole. So, so uh, you know, that spotlight, the, your, your mission, again, is to keep an eye on people who need to be kept an eye on. Um, briefly, it's sort of be self-evident, but I'll ask the dumb question anyway. Why was this necessary? I think, you know, sort of going back, it's, I think it started with uh, a lot of state capitals across the country. The newsrooms there shrunk uh, dramatically over time. And so I think that was the initial idea for Spotlight. You've seen sort of similar institutions across the country try and, and pop up to fill that void. I, I think Texas Tribune, most famously in Texas, uh, sort of popped up to, to fill that void. And in Spotlight, it was, uh, it was the same idea. It was the idea that state government um, wasn't getting the attention it needed to, to get covered. And so the they decided to, to partner with these news these newsrooms decided to partner and uh, really give it that focus and really do like the investigative accountability work um so yeah i mean and so some of the stories i work on you know i spend a lot of time on them and you know it's, it's the kind of stuff that i might not get the same freedom to do uh in 
if I'm, you know, turning out daily stories in another yeah. newsroom. Yeah, yeah, you, uh, anybody with even a passing familiar, familiarization with uh, the kind of journalism you do knows that uh, in addition to resources, time is what you need. Because yeah. these stories are about, you go, in, I'm, you go into your editor, you say, here's what I think we should take a look at. And it's, and it's not, you know, who, you know, who shot who. It's, a, it's a complicated and the long process takes a lot of digging. So time yeah. is uh, really, really a gift in, for what you get now. So let me ask you, then we'll, then we'll get down to some of the stories that caught our interest that you, are, you and Spotlight were responsible for that more directly relate to behavioral health. But before, before we, uh, um, we, we get to that, if, for people in our area, who, who might not have direct access to an, to an inquiry. Maybe they don't subscribe to it. Maybe they're not near that radio station or, or the other local newspapers. Is there a way that they can access Spotlight's work directly? Yeah, absolutely. So spotlightpa.org is our website. Uh, you, you can find all of our stories there, featured prom prominently. We also have a daily newsletter that we send out every weekday, um, PA Post, that you can sign up for there which is a great resource, not only for our stories, but for sort of a look around the state about what's happening. And then we have a, a weekly newsletter. And then, you know, the other thing too, is we have partners. Um, so we have our like core partners, but then we have affiliates that I think we have like several dozen now uh, that, that pick up our stories. So, right, right. so like uh, a variety of newspapers, newsrooms, radio stations, they all uh, run our stories on the website, but spotlightpa.org is the direct source. Uh, let me ask you: Is that is that website that website's not behind a paywall? No paywall. Yeah. So yeah, there's no paywall for for our stories. I think that's part some, of that. Some of what's frustrating is that when you see the story, maybe go to your local paper, and it's behind their paywall, and you know maybe you don't want to don't want to subscribe, so you can go right to it directly, uh, uh, which is great. Uh, yeah. Spotlight, uh, uh, Pennsylvania Spotlight dot org. Uh, SpotlightPA dot org. SpotlightPA dot org. Uh, are you not your nonprofit? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think okay. that was, I, that's, uh, it's, well, so you don't take donate, you take donations. You take donate, yeah, we do donations and fundraise and we're, we have, uh, I think our website, we have, uh, we rely on uh, the generosity of donors. We do fundraising campaigns. I, I, I can't, I don't want to speak for the whole organizational structure. Just, uh, I'm sure we could get that answer. I just, uh, don't have it handy and I want to be careful about that. Um, but yeah, we, we take we rely on on don donors to, to help fund our mission, and then we disclose all of our donors as well. It's all on our website as a measure of transparency. Can we get a uh, brief background on your career as a journalist? How long you been at this? Sure. Yeah, I've been out at this since uh, full time since uh, 2006 or so. Um, I started out as a freelancer for the suburban section of the Philadelphia Inquirer. I grew up uh, in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and then after I went to college in Philadelphia. Um, did a volunteer program in Tacoma, Washington for a little bit after that, uh, working at a homeless shelter and also uh, working on a sort of a, a monthly newspaper there. Came back to Delaware County, freelanced for the Enquirer for a little bit uh, for their suburban section, which was a blast. And then uh, covered K-12 education in center, in center County for the Center Daily Times, which I loved covering education. It was a you know, a fascinating mix of policy and people and politics. Then I uh, moved in 2012 to York, PA, and covered politics there. And then the governor, Tom Wolf, he's from York County, PA. So I covered his campaign for governor in 2014 and uh, joined, and we created an investigative team at the York Daily Record, um, covered a you know, variety of issues there, including domestic violence, uh, access to guns, and some problems in the in, in how things were handled in our, in our local court system. And then I moved to uh, WITF. Uh, they had a project called PA Post uh, in a few years ago, uh, did radio stories, which was fascinating. I love doing radio. And then I worked on the newsletter PA Post. And then uh, about a year ago, Spotlight PA and PA Post merged. And then I got a chance to join Spotlight and I was thrilled to join Spotlight. Um, and really embrace some of the investigative and accountability work they've done there. And since I've been at Spotlight, I focused a lot on uh, human services issues and drug and alcohol issues. Um, and so that's been sort of my, my main focus. Yeah, and those last two drug and alcohol uh, stories that you covered are, are, are of particular interest to us, but 
just one thing to check your bona fides here now. You claim to be a, a proud son of Delco. Okay. Yeah. All right. How do you pronounce W A T E R? <laughs> I changed this a long time ago when I was, I, I do a water. I, I, I have watched Mayor Beast down. I do a lot of home. <laughs> Um, the homes really got me on that show. My my parents talked about that. That uh, did it drive? Did it drive? Did it drive all you Delco people insane or what? Oh, I mean, I loved it. I was the I was watching it, trying to like figure out exactly where is this in Delaware County, and I sort of came uh, to some conclusions. Uh, but that, that the detective, I, I don't know how many people I'm going to go on this, but I feel like the detective was from Upper Darby, and then. <laughs> They were from, like the one detective, the the male detective was from Upper Darby, and the other ones uh, were sort of like uh, Western Delaware County. That sort of yeah, like. yeah, yeah. Naturally, they yeah, they killed the guy from uh, Upper Darby. Uh, <laughs> I didn't listen, want to get others. Yeah, listen, their Daily I, Times was in there. They they hit his paper. He his mom's house had the Daily Times, um, yeah. which I thought was interesting. Well, you know what? I mean, look, Delco is you know. Delco has been the source of a lot of fun in our area for many years. <laughs> they have a great, uh, a great blue collar rep. There's no, there's just no other way to put it. And uh, I spent the last 25 years of my life before moving in uh, up the upper main line in, in Berwyn. And the township is uh, Tredyffin East Town. Okay. Yeah. So when the, the fellow who created the series for who knows the area for yeah. s- somehow or another creates, let's face it, a fictitious idea of what Delco is, he chooses to call the town East Town. Yeah. And I'm telling you, there were people on the upper main line who were going, wait a minute. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, it, it was unrecognizable and people were freaking. And I'm thinking, you're freaked. How do you think those people in Delaware County are feeling? <laughs> so it was a very funny thing. I mean, this is inside stuff for the rest of the country that loved the show because it was great fun. Yeah, you don't know what we're you don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time online looking at where like all the filming locations, and uh, yeah, I spent I went down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They spent a lot of time in Wawa, which is uh, I'm sure around the country they were going, "What the hell did they just say? What is a Wawa anyway?" Yeah, well, uh, I was I, in high school. I did work at a Wawa, so that is very well, um, every, sure, every, yeah. Everybody either worked at a Wawa growing up or flinched something on the way out. Anyway. <laughs> um, Let's get to the let's get to the meat and potatoes of this thing. You've done a, like lots a, a lot of stuff with Spotlight on, on uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. The stuff that uh, caught up my attention, of course, uh, is the drug and alcohol stuff you've done. A couple of pieces come to mind immediately. Uh, first of all, you you did a, 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 a investigation into the uh, Commonwealth's oversight mm-hmm. responsibilities. What are they responsible for with regarded with regarding drug and alcohol facilities in the, in the state. Yeah, and this was a project I worked on with uh, Anari Patani. Uh, she is a reporter and correspondent at Kaiser Health News. She used to work, be a reporter in Pennsylvania. But she and I worked uh, together on this. And the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, they're responsible, responsible for licensing and inspecting uh, several hundred of these drug and alcohol treatment providers in the state. I think it's like around 700 right now. Um, and so they go in, I think we do annual inspections uh, that are scheduled in, in advance, and they're supposed to monitor these places to make sure that they're safe for people to go to. Um, and, you know, I think what we found in our reporting was that there were, um, you know, several shortcomings within the department's uh, work, you know, in, in sort of what they were doing. And we found instances of people who, uh, facilities that despite repeat violations, uh, stayed open and there was harm to people after the after those violations, uh, and that was the that was the big uh, focus of that. Uh, the shortcomings, the shortcomings uh, of uh, the Commonwealth regarding oversight was was it a what was it a uh, a result of probably many things, but what I'm wondering is when the Affordable Care Act came into being, it opened drug and alcohol uh, insurance coverage uh, enormously. And there was a uh, a corresponding uh, explosion in growth of treatment facilities. Was the state playing catch up in that situation? You know, I think our reporting didn't focus so much on like the impact of the Affordable Care Act. I mean, that is definitely a worthy question, one worth exploring. I think we really focused on sort of since the, when the, 
Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs was created, which was 2012. That was sort of our, our main focus because uh, this, this, this department was created. The idea was to, to give drug and alcohol issues the attention that uh, lawmakers felt they deserved. So we really focused on from 2012 on. And I think there were a couple of things we found. One is just the, the actual how the, the lacking of, of staff and resources was, was a chronic issue. There was also just the uh, powers that they did have. They couldn't, they can't find treatment facilities on their own, or they can't find treatment facilities. Even if they find violations or repeat violations, they can't find them. And they are, the department is all, often reluctant to shut down facilities that are have problems or to even reduce their capacity. And that does speak exactly to the issue of just the, the high demand for drug and alcohol treatment because it is important to have these services. And so that that was that is a real conflict and it's it's a conflict of um it, it's the conflict of, of philosophy too. It's like the department what the department's role is. Uh, I think the, the secretary for the department told us that they want to try and keep these places open. They want to try and help them succeed. And so there's there's conflict over uh, what what hap- what to do when places are having chronic problems. Yeah, we, uh, yes, because the alternative is, on the one hand, uh, fix the broken places, mm-hmm. but in the meantime, not throw a hundred people who desperately need help. Yeah, you know, to the wolves, which is uh, uh, what happens. Uh, this thing, this this whole process of oversight by a uh, a Commonwealth, as you say, was born in the middle of this tremendous opioid epidemic that literally was just slaughtering people. Mm -hmm. The introduction of fentanyl, as you know, was a game changer. Mm -hmm. Um, Now people didn't have the luxury of time because the chances of getting a bad mix was was great. So um, beyond that, you ran a piece very recently, which was really an eye opener. Because it just shows how uh, much confusion still exists in what do states do, uh, what do what do local authorities do? They want to help. They know it's no longer strictly a law law enforcement position, um, but we have conflicting laws and regulations. And in this case, a fellow you profiled uh, in his family ran smack dab into one of the one of the really big issues now and that's medical marijuana uh, give us the background on that story sure yeah i'll all sort of start in uh september of 2020 tyler cordero he had a, a long history of struggling with heroin addiction and by september of 2020 he had recently left jail and he was uninsured and he had relapsed and he wanted to get into addiction treatment um, his family says he went to an assessment office uh, to see what his options were. And they say that's when he found out that he had lost his Medicaid coverage, which they didn't really know would happen to him because he had been in jail recently. And then he, he understood that even when you don't have Medicaid, there's this funding system in place that's supposed to catch people who are going to fall through the cracks. And it's uh, the county offices can provide funding to to fill in for coverage until someone gets on Medicaid. But his family says he was told he didn't qualify for that funding. And the reason was his medical marijuana card. Um, They didn't understand it at the time. They thought it was ridiculous, but they were desperate and didn't have much time to think about it. So Tyler's mom and his sister, they kept making phone calls to every hotline, every 800 number they could find looking for help. Meanwhile, he's outside his mom's house, uh, sleeping on the couch going through withdrawal and you know the they had all this struggle and this sister says they kept running into this barrier of this medical marijuana card they tried to navigate the system without insurance mom says they ran into a bunch of problems there as well and eventually a few weeks later he uh walked to a bath he went to his mom's house uh they had pizza they talked about options he went out to go buy to the gas walked to a local gas station to buy cigarettes he went inside the gas station bathroom, overdosed, um, and about, and he died later that evening. His mom, you know, noticed that he was missing about for about 
after about 45 minutes, she drove around and she arrived at the gas station right at the same time as the ambulance. So how, how old was he? He was 24 years old. He started using when he was a teenager. Yeah. Uh, it's a sad story, but one that uh, a lot of people uh, recognize. Mm-hmm. So is this confusion over, on the one hand, uh, the goal of treatment facilities, which is to first thing, get people off the drug they're using or mm-hmm. any drug they're using, because the core belief is that's where you start with all the other therapies that are available to treat addiction. You, you've got to be clean in order to do that. On the other hand, mm-hmm. you can go get a medical marijuana card. If you have chronic pain or if your your substance abuse is causing you anxiety, it's possible to go get a medical card. So when they, in this case, when he tried to get help, his insurance went away because the federal government says marijuana is illegal. How, yeah. do square, how do they square that, sir? So, yeah, so, yeah, and so it's, it's complicated. And so, yeah, the, I mean, the big thing is that in his case was the funding issue. You know, the treatment providers I talk to, I mean, they, they talk about harm reduction. So like they, they say they don't, they're not going to turn someone away because of, medical, of marijuana or medical marijuana. I mean, one treatment provider compared it to, to cigarettes, you know, <laughs> like they're not going to turn, like heroin is far more deadly and that's the immediate thing. And that's what they're going to focus on. So it's really, in his case, it, it's all about paying for the treatment. Um, and you know, I'll, you know, I'll just back up, you know, so he lost his Medicaid because he went to jail and there's uh, federal rules in place that if you go to jail, your Medicaid, you know, essentially the rules make it so that your Medicaid gets, gets shut off. Um, and so he went to jail uh, and his Medicaid got suspended. He didn't realize it till later. Um, and by the time he realized it, trying to jump through the hoops to get the Medicaid back was you know, gonna take time. Um, and so, you know, so that's why, that's why he doesn't have insurance. And then so to, the other part is, I'll, I'll back up a little bit, but so in 2018, Pennsylvania um, Department of Health added opioid use disorder as one of their conditions that can make someone eligible for medical marijuana. Um, so they have some qualifiers on that, but that's essentially opioid use disorder. You can get, you can qualify for medical marijuana. Um, and then in 2019, the federal government uh, sends out this notification with these uh, funding rules related to, um, facil- you know, re- related to uh, people who get this money from SAMHSA, it's called the, the federal agency. Mm-hmm. And it basically says you can't use this federal money, give it to people who permit marijuana use to treat substance use. And so the big, there's ambiguity or concern about what it means to permit, you know. Um, how how wide how wide is that ban? Uh, federal government says that you know a few months later in January 2020 they sent out an email with new with clarification guidance to all of the states um, who got this grant money, telling them that it's not as widespread. The ban is not as big as it seems, um, and that in fact federal money you know can be used uh, to, to to help these people as long as they are willing to work towards alternatives essentially yeah yeah um, well you know i mean the, the history of this uh, whole issue of uh, medically assisted treatment um is long uh, it's improving uh, we have moved i think in most most reputable treatment facilities past the notion of pure abstinence uh you know medicines drugs are used to fight serious addictions marijuana is a little different because again the government is standing there going, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, where so look, how would you characterize the Commonwealth's uh, good faith effort when they say in the Commonwealth, if you need help, if you're in trouble, you should be able to get help. We'll help you. I mean, that's what they say. Yeah. Um, I, I think you think they're sincere in that. Oh, I, I'm not here to question people's sincerity. Um, but I mean, the, the question is whether there are cracks in this system, right? And there's an acknowledgement of the cracks in the system. I mean, I think that's the big question. I think that was Susan Osterman, uh, the mother of Tyler. I mean, that was her big concern throughout, you know, many interviews with her is you can't, she, in her view, you can't fix this until you acknowledge what went wrong in this case. And so I think the, the issue in Tyler's case that we were trying to report out is 
how why and so we you know many of these drug and alcohol offices wouldn't provide federal money to people to pay for treatment for people like Tyler. You know, we had questions about if how how often they were using other money to fill in the gaps. It, it wasn't clear. You know, a lot of places wouldn't elaborate on on their policies. Um, and you know the so that that's the big question you know for for us and driving and looking forward is what are these places going to be doing now and are they recognizing you know what happened in this and are have they filled the holes in in this system? Yeah, uh, I've spoken to some people in the in the uh, in that um, business, and you're right. If you go to a reputable facility and and need to be admitted. With the substance abuse issue, and you have a medical marijuana card, most of the good ones they're not going to turn you away, but they're also not going to dispense marijuana. Yeah, yeah. Just, that's not they don't have a license to do it to begin with, uh, and they probably don't want to go down that road until there's more evidence about its efficacy. So, yeah, and, uh, and I just want to say one thing on that too. I mean, in the you know the tricky in in Susan Susan says her I mean Tyler in her view would have glad I mean she says he offered to give it up. And she said, you give up anything at that point. So, you know, for them, it was they ran into this barrier for this medical marijuana that wasn't, uh, you know, they, they, they would be glad, they, in their view, they would have been glad to have given it up. I mean, there are some yeah. people who might argue yeah. about whether you should have to, but in that instance, they're saying we would we, give it up, but it wasn't presented as an option. Yeah, we're speaking to uh, uh, investigative journalist Ed Mahan, Mahan and, uh, about his work with Spotlight uh, PA. Uh, on some of these issues covering drug and alcohol treatment uh, in the uh, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, so um, so Ed, this this fellow um, was a victim of this mess, and that's the only way to describe it. There are a lot of moving parts here uh, in order to get something more streamlined, and in in a context of people who, who need help right now, mm -hmm. if they're sitting in front of somebody saying, "I need help." They need it now. Mm -hmm. They don't need to run into a bureaucratic mess. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's happening. Who has to come together in your mind uh, to, to get this thing uh, more orderly? You know, I think there are a couple of different views on that. But I mean, the SAMHSA has told us that people in Tyler's situation are eligible for this funding. And so I think the question is to making sure that, you know, all of these, to, so yeah, that the, so I, maybe just back up for one second. So we got this big, the federal government gives this money to the state, who then gives it to these 47 county drug and alcohol offices, who then use it for a lot of reasons, a lot of things, but one of those things is paying for addiction treatment. So, I mean, those three, those, the, the feds, the state, and these dozens of drug and alcohol offices, they should, and they, it would be good if they were all on the same page about what the rules are and what the limits are and what they can and can't do. And the feds are saying that they can use this for this money. I mean, I think that the, the, one of the issues we explored in the story is like why this guidance wasn't shared earlier. The feds said they shared it in January, 2020. The state, you know, they didn't send out an information bulletin with this information until June of this year after Tyler's mother had reached out with a variety of concerns. So it, if the idea is that if, if those entities are on the same page and if it's consistent across these dozens of drug and alcohol offices across the state. So the, these offices that exist now across the state, would you advise someone in a similar situation? They have a loved one or themselves who need treatment, don't understand uh, whether they qualify for uh, coverage by somebody. Do they call that office first? Is that a good? Uh, um, I, mean, I think. I mean, I think the 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 helpline, the offices. The, I mean, different counties have different systems for for their assessment offices. But I mean, I think knowing, being able to point to this guidance and to, um, I mean, I think to say, to say what they what they know and what the guidance is, um, and to push back. If they're, if they're hearing something differently. I think that, that having that knowledge and, and, and is helpful to try and navigate that system. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, this is um, a little off, not off the point, you mentioned something earlier. Um, incarceration, what did you, uh, if anything, learn about what goes on when someone uh, is incarcerated with regard to treatment? What kind of treatment can someone expect to get 
in, in, the, in the, locked up in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I haven't explored that so much in this story. I know county jails vary in the type of medication assistant treatment they provide, but I, I'm not, uh, I haven't done a story about that. It's definitely an area I'm, well, I'm interested in reporting more on, but I know that some counties offer medication assisted treatment and some don't. Well, I guess, I mean, it, you frame this story in, in, uh, against the tragic backdrop of a young guy overdosing. Um, but I came away with it at least with the sense that in my lifetime, we've gone from lock them up. That's it. That was the strategy. Just say no. If you don't, we're going to lock you up to no, we've got to do something mm -hmm. and, uh, on an official level, on, on, on a statewide and a federal level. We've got to do something. So when I look at stories that go, OK, here's what's going on. They're not doing it well. They got to do a little better. At least we're there. Correct. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's uh, definitely a good perspective to have on this. I, I think, you know, we talk about the Medicaid issue as well. For instance, you know, he this all happened to Tyler. He got uh, spent like nearly two weeks in jail in August of 2020 on a drug, on a, like a, an old drug paraphernalia conviction. Um, that is what led him to have his Medicaid suspended. Shortly after that, in September of 2020, um, the state changed some of its practices with the idea that they, they created more of a, a delay in when somebody loses their Medicaid benefits. They created this 15 day delay before that formal process starts. So potentially if that system was working the way it's, it, the way, if that system in September, that system had been in place in August then he wouldn't have lost his Medicaid and this wouldn't have been an issue. Um, there's still ways you can have gaps with this new system with, with Medicaid. So potentially that would, you know, help address situations like this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are, and, and I think what the the state is, you know, the Wolf administration is, uh, their you know their public position. What they told us is, you know, this is a right people have the right to access addiction treatment, and so it's a matter of addressing you know when the, when the system mm -hmm. falls short of that. Yeah. Uh, listen, we we thank you for your time. We really appreciate your work. Ed Mahan from uh, Spotlight PA, you guys are doing, you know, some great stuff. I don't know where else we'd find out about this, these issues, if it weren't for organizations that uh, are coming together like uh, Spotlight PA did. Uh, hey, can you before we let you go, what are you working on? Anything you can tell us about? Uh, we're doing some follow ups related to this, uh, to this issue, uh, to the medical marijuana issue. I'm not sure the uh, timeline for that. And, um, you know, I think we've, we've, we've been following the, we didn't talk about this on the show today, but recovery house legislation, uh, there's supposed to be, so a few years ago, the state, uh, lawmakers, they passed a law, uh, creating this system for oversight of recovery homes. Um, and the, the process of actually getting those rules in place has been delayed several times because there's a big concern about if you make the rules too strict, you're going to do more harm than good. Yeah, these are the sober. These are the sober houses that have uh, uh, proliferated. Uh, the, the sort of a transitionary period out of uh, treatment that need. Yeah, they need to be. There needs to be a little more uh, rules and regs on that one. So you're yeah. working on that. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to that work too, because that that could uh, that could go a long way towards shedding light on this. Hey Ed, thanks so much, uh, folks. You know that this stuff's out there. You can access it locally. Uh, Pennsylvania spotlightpa.org. That's how you get a hold of them. Uh, you got any good stories? Ed's phone's probably always open. Reporters are the easiest guys in the world to get a hold of. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's our pleasure. The rest of you, thanks for hanging. Catch you next time on The Corner, The Behavioral Corner. Take care. Every storm runs out of rain, according to the great Maya Angelou. Her words can remind us of one very simple truth that storms do cross our paths, but they don't last forever. So the question remains, how do we ride out this storm of COVID-19 and all the other storms life may throw our way? Where do we turn when issues such as mental health or substance abuse begin to deeply affect our lives? Look to Retreat Behavioral Health. With a team of industry-leading experts, they work tirelessly to provide compassionate, holistic, and affordable treatment. Call to learn more today. 855-802-6600. Retreat Behavioral Health, where healing happens.
that's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner.